Landlines um, sort of starts in the in the winter of 2021. Um, it's in the final lockdown in the UK um, when we've all been confined to to our locality, just yeah. just held in our in our little local areas and not able to walk too far um, and not far enough for moth. As we discovered when we walked the southwest coast path. Moth's illness, a neurodegenerative disease for which he'd been told there was no treatment and no cure. When we'd walked those 630 miles of those headlands, um, we'd found that his health improved in ways he'd been told were impossible. So when his health really started to decline again during the winter of 2021, it just seemed like the obvious thing to do, just to try one more time. But Moth... Moth was starting to accept that, um, that, that the really awful end stages of his illness were getting closer and that maybe, maybe actually he could accept that, that that was going to be what was going to happen. But I couldn't accept that. I couldn't accept that, that we should just allow this illness to overtake us without trying just one more time. So there was one night when I was just putting some logs in the log basket. Behind our log basket is our bookshelf and I knocked some books off the bottom shelf of the bookshelves and they were the guidebooks to, to paths that we'd walked. Guide, the guidebook that we'd used for the Southwest Coast Path, it was a, a fat guidebook that had been distorted by water. The edges of it were, were rippled like the beach when the tide goes out and in it there were pieces of paper and bits of string and feathers and sand and and the feeling of the coast path and then alongside that there was another guidebook there was a guidebook to Iceland and a long walk that we'd taken there and I opened that and it smelt like sulfur and ash and volcanoes and then there was this other tiny little thin guidebook, one that we'd never used, but it was the guidebook to the Cape Wrath Trail. And in that moment, I just knew, I knew that if anything was going to encourage Moth to try one more time, it was going to be that walk, because it was a place he'd always wanted to go, always wanted to spend time, but never had enough time. And so I left it around the house, I left it in the kitchen and in the bathroom and everywhere you could see it. And eventually, eventually he picked it up and said, yep, yeah, OK, we're going north. And that was just the start, the start of, of what became so much more than just a walk. It became an adventure. It became an experience of a changing country, of a changing landscape and of us changing within it. And we headed north. We headed north to just to walk the Cape Wrath Trail. The Cape Wrath Trail is 230 miles through the most remote, the most isolated part of Britain. It crosses through areas such as the Great Wilderness, areas that have been used and abused by man for centuries, but are not reachable by road. So you can only get into them on foot or, or by boat. Areas that have been deforested over the years and have now become, become just the, the, the land of the deer and the, and the golden eagle. And Noidart, a beautiful, beautiful stretch of land, equally, equally remote, equally isolated. But why, why, why take somebody who is so ill to this, to this place, right. to this wild, remote area? And... And I was I was consumed with guilt at that point, guilt for having taken him there. For because when someone you care for is ill, the thing that you really want to do is just to wrap them in cotton wool and keep them safe. But this walking in this wild environment had been the only thing that had ever helped Moth's health, and so it just seemed to be the only thing that we could do. And we started walking from a point south of Cape Wrath, because it was closed off by the military, from this beautiful little beach called Shagra. Shagra is just a place that glows pink in the sunset, just as the, as the sun catches, catches the rocks, catches these ancient like bedrocks of our northern 
point of the country, the most ancient rocks in the country. There's Torridonian sandstone and Luigian nice and and just that feel, that feel that you are standing on the very, very oldest point of the country, the point where everything emanates from. And in that moment, just as we were looking out over the cliffs, about to start or walking on this incredible, impossible journey, this dark form lifted off from the cliffs beneath us and flew out over the sea, just as the light was starting to dip. And we just caught sight of this huge, huge, fast, dark bird with its white tail. It was a white tailed sea eagle just taking off from the cliffs. So a bird that had been extinct in this country, but had been brought back from Norway, from, from colonies in Norway and, and re-established in this country. And now is actually finding that it can actually live here again and it almost became a symbol of hope for our journey hope that things can come back from the brink not just moth's health but this planet this this earth this country in which we live because prior to this walk i thought actually climate change hadn't reached us it hadn't reached our shores but this change this walk it changed how i felt about that it changed how i viewed everything with regards to this landscape. We walk through this incredible remote land, through a land that's really, it belongs to the deer. This, the deer that roam on the hillsides and are such a, a symbol of freedom and space and, and that expression of what we believe we still have. The land of the golden eagle that, that just, inhabit those same glens that, that share that space. And it was during that time, during that time through that boggy, wet, incredible landscape that we were walking out of a village on the, on the west coast of, uh, of uh, the north of Scotland. And suddenly we were being passed by, by Lots of young people, people in their early teens, their early 20s, passing us, passing us by on a Wednesday evening, just heading out into the wilderness, seven miles away from the coast, away from the village, away from habitation. Eventually, we had to say, where are you going? Where are you all going on a Wednesday night? And they said, oh, we're just climbing Solven. Solven is this incredible mountain in ascent that just like seems to like form up out of the land into, into like a fin of rock, a dark fin of rock. And it's notoriously difficult to, uh, difficult to climb. But these young people were all heading up this mountain on a Wednesday night. We were saying, what are you doing? Why are you, why are you doing this? And they said, well, there's nothing to do in the village on a Wednesday night. So we thought we'd just go up the mountain. A strange, a strange and unexpected answer, I, I have to say. But I've come to realise since that, that that is an absolute result of Scotland having the Land Reform Act, having a right to access the land for their for their cultural and the cultural knowledge of the landscape and its heritage, their natural heritage. Do we have that elsewhere in the country? I don't think so. But also, do we see our young people accessing the mountainsides, walking into the environment simply because there's nothing else to do in the village on a Wednesday night? I don't think so. But I held that idea as we were walking along. I held it sort of in the back of my mind as we walked into this, this incredible landscape a place that is just full of water and bog. And we headed down into a, into a valley bottom late in an afternoon as the rivers were rising and water was pouring from the skies in just torrents of rain. We forded a river and headed into a glen that was just becoming wetter and wetter and wetter by the moment. And as we did so, partway through this glen that we had to get to the other side of and, and ford another river before we could get out, Moth fell, cutting his head. 
dazed, confused, we had to put the tent up. And we sat in the tent on the only piece of dry ground, unwaterlogged ground that we could find. And we sat in the tent for two days as the rain just pounded down, turning the hillsides into waterfalls, turning a river into a huge cascade. But then it finally stopped and I opened the tent flaps and there, in that incredible, incredible valley of water, the sun cut beneath the, the cloud line and turned the whole valley into a prism of light. And on the other side of this patch of dry ground was a deer. It was a stag and he shook himself like a, like a dog when it comes out of the bath. He shook himself and the, the water droplets around him turned into a a rainbow of light in this valley of light. And in that moment, there was a huge, huge sense of being part of the landscape, not being observers of it, not watching a scene, but being as much part of that landscape as the, as the deer, as the mountainside, as the water itself. And I held that thought too. And I took that with that thought of those, of those young people climbing that mountain as we passed on and on through, through Scotland, through some of the most beautiful parts of this country, some of the most wild, desolate parts of this country. And held on to that idea of connection and how you have to feel as if you are part of the landscape before you can feel connected to it. And then we headed south in a, in a walk that, that turned into something epic, into an epic exploration of the land and not just a walk across it. We walked south along the West Highland Way through, through the borderlands of Scotland to, to the borders of, of the country, to the border between England and Scotland and down onto the Pennine Way. The Pennine Way, 260 miles of moorland, of blanket bog that cover this, this spine of England in this incredible thing that we have in such enormous, vast quantities in this country, blanket bog, which is an incredible, incredible asset in this time of climate change because it holds millions and millions of tons of carbon locked there in these boglands that cover the moorlands of the Pennines. Blanket bogs that were so dry, so bone dry, not wet, not oozing in water, not running in streams or holding rivers of water, but bone dry and blowing in the wind. And they became almost like a metaphor for what we were seeing through the rest of the country, where we were seeing, we were seeing a country that should be wet, drying out in a, in a landscape that had no trees and no water. And we were seeing livestock dying. There were dead sheep on some days, dead sheep every hundred meters, dead rabbits. And the Pennines became that view of the Pennines, of, of a land that should have been wet and oozing and holding, holding all that moisture as being a place that was actually becoming the opposite. A place where thousands of feet over, over decades had, had worn that, that, that blanket bog of peat, had worn it away. And that peat and blanket bog was now not becoming a carbon locker, but becoming a carbon emitter. And it made us realise that actually this landscape in which we live is changing so quickly. Um, and unless we actually view it, unless we actually see it, we can't see how it's changing. And even to the point where the dreaded midges of the north of Scotland are actually now moving south and they're moving right down south to the south of the Pennines. And that in itself should be something we should all fear. But how can we fear it if we don't see it, if we can't actually see it? And that brings me back to, go, to those people that we saw, those young people in Scotland. And they have access to the countryside and they can see it and they can feel it and they can tell what's happening in it. If the rest of us in the rest of the country don't have that access, we can't tell how the country is changing. We can't Enough. tell how the countries are moving. And if the midges are moving, how long then before it starts to affect our lives? And we actually become the cuckoos ourselves.